We have been studying together the book of Acts, and we are up to the end of chapter 13. So we're beginning uh, chapter 13, verse 48. We'll be ending in the 14th chapter. Just before these verses that we're reading, Paul and Barnabas have been speaking, and uh, they've answered boldly the questions about Gentiles and about the gospel, and they say, this is what the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth, and uh, which, of course, we as Gentiles are the beneficiaries of, right? And then beginning verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them, and they went on to Lyconium. Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Catch that? They're booted out, shake the dust off their feet, and they are filled with the joy and, Holy, and, the, and the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of the Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stoned them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconium cities of Lystra, Lystra and Derby, and to the surrounding country where, guess what? They continued to preach the good news. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we identify ourselves today as people who believe in your word, people who read and study your word, people who gather together to challenge one another and lift one another up and encourage each other in the word. We are ancestors of the way, people who did this very thing 2,000 years ago. And we continue that tradition and that that teaching and that important ministry today to gather our body of believers together to worship you magnificently as we did this morning with this great worship group. And Lord, we commit ourselves to reading your word, to standing up in public and declaring this word. And then we turn to the preaching of your word. And we ask your Holy Spirit to go before us and to clear away the obstacles in our minds and in our hearts so that we can hear you clearly today. Thy word have we hidden in our hearts. This word that is a, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We open it again and again to be taught from it. Because it is eternal. It has eternality. It is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. And even longer than that in the Old Testament. 
because it is living. It is the living, active Word of God, still able to pierce to the very marrow of life. So, Lord, we turn our attention to you today. We ask that you would enlighten us through your word. We want to uphold as a congregation and a body here the afflicted and people who are hurting today. And ask that the power and might of your Holy Spirit might come alongside them and give them great comfort. And Lord, we want to uphold those who have been touched by death and by serious illness in this congregation. We have at least five spouses here we know of who have experienced the death of a loved one this last year. So we pray, Lord, that you would just comfort them, that you would be an ever-present help to them in times of trouble and distress. Lord, we want to uphold our country. We want to uphold our new president, new vice president, new Congress, new House, new Senate, Governors, lieutenant governors, attorney generals. No matter the political party, we uphold the Constitution. And Lord, we uphold your word. But we are most faithful to your word. We will do as your word commands us to do. And so we pray today that you would give us wisdom and how we conduct our affairs of life, and how we speak to one another, words of encouragement and comfort and cheer and uplifting, because we know that is what you call us to. So today we, uh, we turn to your word, and we say, to you be honor and glory through the teaching and preaching of your word. We ask this in the strong, strong name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you, Ron. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, But mission work is hard. We're going to talk about uh, being in the mission field today. Uh, Let me just describe Paul's mission life. This is going to start in these chapters we've been uh, studying. The Acts 13 and 14 is Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, over the years now, here's what Paul is going to experience. Uh, I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That's this morning in X 14. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city and in danger in the country, in danger at sea and in danger from false brothers. On and on, he's labored and toiled and experienced near-death experience. Uh, Mission work is difficult. Uh, I could add to Paul's list um, how tough it is. Uh, I have to wear this thing every week, (laughs) and and it brings a slight irritation. So I know what Paul's going through. (laughs) Uh, um, We we had a big church mess years ago at my first church, and um, I was the only staff member left. Uh, It was just implosion. Um, I was the youth pastor at the time. Everybody, uh, church split. About 20 people left with a a pastor that was in sin. And uh, the next day, I had to kind of keep the everything together. So the first three meetings I had the next day, it was a Monday morning, first three meetings, all three men that I met with made sure to show me that they were packing guns. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they made sure. One guy had to flip open his glove, uh, glove compartment. Hey, come in my car. You know, I'm carrying this. I'm like, all right, tough guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, one time I walked into church. Talk about horrible. Uh, Paul's list sounds bad, but listen to what I had to go through once. <laughs> um, I walk into church, a previous church, I walk in and uh, someone says, here, Dave, you need to hold this bag. So I have this bag. I'm like, what's this for? Well, people started coming up to me, putting cards in it, uh, birthday cards and Mars bars. Now, I don't like Mars bars. And I must say, I got a lifetime supply of Mars bars in a pretty big bag. And I'm like, I know what Paul 
talked about in 2 Corinthians 11. Imagine that. I mean, they're edible, but I don't crave them. Reese's peanut butter cup, that, but no, Mars bars. So mission work is hard. That's my point. Oh, it's been so rough. Um, it's been 65 years, and I didn't know it was January 8th. That's my uh, oldest birthday. Uh, 65 years ago last month uh, was when uh, Jim Elliott, Elizabeth Elliott's husband, and the other missionaries in Ecuador died, uh, slaughtered on the beachhead there. Uh, it's been 65 years since then, and you know that they were killed, if you know the story. Elizabeth Elliott went in behind them, um, and uh, the Lord used her to lead many in that tribe to the Lord. Um, but imagine uh, they, they died it, on false pretenses. They pretend to be friends, and then the natives there slaughtered the missionaries. Mission work is hard. Paul is on his first mission journey here. Anyways, I, I just say somewhere in the mid-40s A.D., Paul and Barnabas go on this trip, and uh, after prayer and fasting, uh, the Holy Spirit tells them to go, and they go, and it's the first trip. Uh, he goes from, leaves Syria, goes through the island of Cyprus, hits Asia Minor and then heads back. Um, and it was tough. So today we're going to talk about mission work is difficult. And we each have a mission. Whether you know it or not, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you are a missionary. Uh, now think about this. In your ministry and your mission, the uh, problem with being a Christian is this. Um, being called to always act like one. You know what I mean? Mm. How many of you have to bite your tongue or other things when um, you're driving and you'd like to confront another driver, but you can't because you're a Christian. <laughs> um, we had uh, kids growing up, I was always coaching them in, in one sport or another. Um, I, I couldn't say things I wanted to say to the ref or the ump uh, hmm, or a neighbor. Uh, no, that's the problem with being a Christian is always trying to act like Jesus. Um, it's one thing to go overseas and serve where everyone knows you as the outsider, as the missionary. Um, they, they know it coming in, that you're going to be different, basically. Uh, I had a friend that runs a camp uh, in Wisconsin. He called me years ago. I was 19 or 20 years old. Uh, he said he got a call from this guy who donates to camp, and he said he, he wants to hire somebody who um, doesn't come to work drunk or high. And the guy said, Dave. So he called me, and um, I, I got the job. It was a job I worked at for eight years. It was a great job. Um, it, it was at a law firm. But I don't know what they said. Uh, th th this new guy starts Monday. And uh, I don't know what they said about me. But here's what happened. As I walk in, first couple of weeks, people would you know, see me coming down the hallway. And they would hide their coffee cup. Just kind of put their hand over it. You know, <laughs> real awkwardly. Like uh, if, if I was walking somewhere and someone swore, uh, they would look at me and apologize. Like, oh my goodness, Sorry. And I was like, my ears aren't going to bleed. I, I say those words in my mind when I, when I think of you. No. Uh, don't swear in front of the new guy. Uh, think about it. Uh, being a missionary overseas, one thing, is an outsider. But living here where you always have to act like Jesus, I mean, that's kind of what you're called to do. Live like Jesus, act like Jesus, react like Jesus. Um, you are a missionary amongst your own people. Yeah. Problem is, you always have to act like Jesus. Uh, you know, be different from the world. That's what we're called to do. You're in the world, but not of the world. Uh, I heard this phrase. I read an article, Disney Institute on customer service. They train their employees. Uh, the most often asked question is this. Now, I heard this question and said, uh, if, how many of you have the gift of sarcasm? <laughs> yes, okay. Your, your brain might ex explode. Think of all the sarcastic things you could answer a customer. When a customer walks up to you and asks this most often asked question, what time is the three o'clock parade? <laughs> you have to be nice to answer that. Mm. Uh, you're, if you know Jesus, you're on a mission from God. You are in the people business. And in this mission, these people will accept you or reject you. They will talk about you. They will fail you and discourage you. They will leave you or believe you. They will run out on you. They will help you. But uh, there's something blessed about w when they join you. When they join you. Well, it's, that's missions. Paul is on a mission trip here and Barnabas, Acts 13 and 14. Um, the ideal mission would go like this. Uh, Paul traveled unmolested all over Asia and Europe and the Mideast. Everyone he talked to got saved. 
Uh, it was a breeze to just walk from town to town and heal and touch people and save people. Now, I've been confronted. Um, I keep saying that because we, we had a mission group that left our old church, and they were real nervous about going to uh, certain places because the main dish was guinea pig. Now, I had people come to me and say, Dave, guinea pig is good. So I'm not making fun of guinea pig. I'm just telling you it's a cross-cultural thing. We don't eat guinea pig here. At least I looked last night. They don't sell it at Bashes. Apparently, Nick eats guinea pig. Um, wait, guinea pig is good, so I'm going to change that. Okay, hamster. Um, Paul, Paul traveled unmolested. He, he tried guinea pig, and he loved it. He absolutely loved it. He went back to Antioch, and he ate guinea pig all the time. So, and he, he lived happily ever after. Amen? Is that how Acts goes? That's how your mission is going to go. Now, there are some positives from this first missionary journey, as well as Paul's second and third missionary journeys. Then you know he traveled to Rome. Uh, within 250 years from uh, that prayer and fasting meeting, Christianity becomes the dominant religion. Within 255 years, you remember the story Constantine realizes uh, if he can't beat him, he might as well join him. So Constantine gets saved. I'm not sure he gets saved, but he at least acted like he got saved. Um, uh, the, the dominant religion of the world. In fact, they'll arrest you if you don't become a Christian, starting from Constantine. Uh, it would yield, by 2015, 2.3 billion professing followers of Jesus, starting from the prayer and fasting meeting in Acts 13. Uh, eventually, it would help place Christian witness in virtually every country in the world. Paul's journeys are going to result in 13 of the 29 books, at least half of the Old Testament or New Testament, uh, going to be written, launched from that prayer and fasting meeting. So uh, are you excited about the mission work? Because there's a lot of positives. Uh, negatives from Paul's mission work, he got beat up, he got tortured, he got stoned, he was left for dead, he was discouraged. He went poor, he went hungry, and he bled, literally bled for this mission. Are you still excited? Today we're going to move from global missionaries to local missionaries, uh, and you are a local missionary. You, Jesus said, are salt, if you know Jesus as your Savior. You are light. You are a minister of reconciliation. You are, we are a kingdom of priests. You are witnesses who witness in power, you are. So the question is, uh, salt, are you salty? Light, are you shining? Ministers of reconciliation, are you pointing people to Jesus? Uh, witnesses, are you, in fact, powerful? See, think about this strategy. You come together once a week in corporate worship, and then you live near each other for the most part, but then you buy separate housing spread out all over the neighborhood, and you work on your neighbors, and you try to get them to see Jesus in your life, and you're the wheat, and the weeds are living next to you, and you're, your life is so inviting that they look up at you and say, how, how can I be wheat? That's the strategy. So true, while there are lost people in Romania and unsaved people in Russia, and there's people that need to hear the gospel in Macedonia, and there's people that need to get saved in Liberia, those are all true. Uh, sometimes it's easier, think about it, easier to cross the border into Mexico and witness and a little bit harder to cross the street and witness to a neighbor. Sometimes cross-cultural ministry is easier than cross-cubicle and inviting a co-worker to church. It's sometimes easier to pray for a missionary than it is to pray for a neighbor who's going through a rough spot in their marriage. Sometimes it's easier to give money to a mission than it is to give to that, those people that live in that apartment or that food bank across town. Uh, fact is, you are called into a war. When you pray, thy kingdom come, you're praying uh, for a declaration of war. You're called to a rescue operation, and the people that need rescuing are all around you. You're called into a difficult mission. It is going to be hard. You are a missionary. It's not for the faint of heart. Uh, as you give, it, it will be a blessing. Please hear that. It will be a blessed life. Um, this mission we're on, God has given us so much. He lavishes love. He pours out grace. He gives wisdom for the asking. Uh, he has mercy that you can never outdo him on. He gives and gives and gives, blessed by so much from God. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. 
So expect that. It's a blessed life, this life of giving, this life of mission. So today we're going to look at Paul's first mission journey and just some encouragements here, some reminders for fellow missionaries like, like Paul, fellow missionaries that need some encouragement and reminders and even a warning. Know this, fellow missionaries, God is going to measure your life not by results, but by faithfulness. Now, that comes from 13.4, from 14.6 through 7. Uh, He's not going to measure it by the world's success or what even Christians would deem a successful ministry. He's going to measure it by faithfulness, not by converts, not by buildings, not by popularity, not by any of those things, but faithfulness. Paul is on this missionary journey. Uh, Let me know if this sounds successful. Um, Starting in 13.4, uh, Paul and Barnabas go the whole length of an island, the island of Cyprus, with John Mark. He's, he's with them. John Mark sees some incredible things in Jerusalem. He sees some incredible things in Antioch. He goes on this mission journey with them. They land in Salamis and no converts. No one gets saved. No one gets saved forever, it seems like, until they get to Paphos. And in Paphos, no, no Antioch experience, no Jerusalem experience, no Pentecost experience at all. Nothing like what happens with Cornelius. Nothing. One third of the mission troop leaves. John Mark leaves. He says, guys, this wasn't what I expected. And he gets out of there. Instead of people getting saved and praising God, they're fighting with the missionaries. Paul uh, in w- one of these places here, he gets so sick. The place God leads him, by the way, he gets so sick uh, that he almost dies. They run out of food, they run out of money, not knowing where their next meal is going to come from. Cyprus doesn't turn into Antioch, but a, a spiritual barren wasteland. Does that sound like a success to you? Hmm. Paul says this on his second missionary journey, I think, to Thessalonica. He says this to the church at Thessalonica. First Thessalonians 2, 1 Thessalonians 2.1, You know, brothers, that our trip to you was not a failure. Not a failure. Why did he say that? Because from human eyes, it looked like a failure. But here's the thing, Paul says, we're trying to please God, not you. So take heart. God does not look at how successful you are. He measures you and your life and your mission by faithfulness. Um, Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15 and following, maybe verse 13 here. His work, the missionary's work, will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire, fire will test the quality, not the quantity, but the quality of each person's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. The quality. God is going to look at the quality. What's the quality? The faithfulness. The deciding factor will be your faithfulness to the calling God has put you in. The calling starting in your home, starting in your marriage, starting in your mission work that he has called you to. He's not going to be counting heads to see how many you've saved. He's going to be asking the question, are you faithful. Will you trust me? You think about that measuring stick, it's possible that in glory, um, the little elderly lady who simply has an intense prayer warrior type ministry could be in God's eyes more faithful than like a Billy Graham or a Mother Teresa or a missionary who has been out there for decades. Think about that because God's measuring faithfulness. He doesn't say to parents, turn your kids into Billy Graham Juniors. He says, be faithful and train a child in the way he or she should go. Hebrews 11 has a two lists for you at the end of that great faith chapter. One list are people that get stoned and are poor and destitute and they get sawed in half. Who wants to be in that group? Hmm. The other group are people that win wars and administer justice and sit on thrones and both groups. It's totally different, but the one thing they have in common is faithfulness. Faithfulness. We are all called to be ministers of reconciliation. Some are called to minister to thousands. Some are called to minister to two little toddlers. Hmm. So be faithful. It's a life that is measured by faithfulness. Please know it. Not numbers, not worldly success, not riches, but faith. And what is faith? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us faith obeys when God commands. Faith believes when God promises. Faith follows when God calls. As you're standing before your 
Lord and Savior, your King, your Shepherd someday, uh, he's not going to be disappointed in your life because you didn't lead your whole block to the Lord. Huh? He's just going to wonder if you were faithful and did you trust him and were you kind and uh, were you a peacemaker? Were you giving water to people who needed it? Were you nice? Were you faithful? So know that missionary's life is measured by faithfulness. Uh, it's also measured with, uh, met with resistance. Here's uh, chapter 13, 6 through 12. We did that last week. Ron read today. Uh, so disgusted. They, they wiped the dust off their feet and they leave because they were rejected. Um, it's going to meet with resistance. Uh, we tend to put a human face on weeds. Um, we talked about weeds last week. Remember this. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the weed planter, the enemy, Jesus calls him. It's Satan. Uh, in fact, what Jesus said, know this. Jesus said, it's better for people, people who lead innocent people into sin. It's better if a millstone is tied to that person's neck. I think in, the, in hell, there's going to be different degrees of punishment. God hates when people are led to the Lord. You're going to see some of that. Ron read some of it. But in chapter 14, people leading others into sin. God hates that kind of thing. And, and the, the, the spirit of love confronting these kind of devils, Paul does. So know this. Your, your mission life is going to have some resistance. What kind of resistance, Dave? Right? I can hear you answering, uh, asking that. Well, one is going to be a sort of violence and persecution. Look what happens to Paul in uh, verse 19. Then some, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. Stone me some more. Okay, know this. On your mission work, you're going to meet some resistance. Here's the form of resistance you're going to face. Violence, persecution. Christians still die today for their faith. In fact, Christian, violence against Christians, um, what do they say? The last 100 years of the 20th century, more Christians died for their faith than the previous centuries combined. Uh, Christians back then were fed to lions. They, uh, they had tar poured on them and used to light gardens. Thank you, Jesus. They got their heads chopped off. Isaiah was the one in Hebrews that it says he uh, got sawed in half. Um, you are going to face some violence and persecution. Now, thank God we don't see it in our country yet. <laughs> kidding. Okay. No, it's coming though. It's coming. The Bible says it's coming. So Christians know this. On your mission field, you're going to face some violence and persecution. What other forms of resistance are you going to face? Well, uh, false doctrine. That's in chapter 13, verse 6. Paul's first missionary journey, false doctrine. It's probably the most resistance we face today. I got an email this week from a guy who professes to be a believer. He, uh, his, he said he's got a new book out. He was begging people to grab his book online. Uh, his book shows proof that the Book of Mormon, the Bible that we read, and uh, the Koran are all the same books and lead to the same path. What that is is false teaching. Yeah, it was really not a break guy, but it, was, it clicked on immediately. This is false. Hmm. Now, you're going to come in contact with people who are really sincere, really tender, really gentle. They're going to use words like love and Jesus, and they're heading straight for hell. Now, don't be duped. Don't be deceived by not standing on God's word. They are blinded by the cults of this age. Uh, I remind the kids that the occult is anything dealing with the satanic and the demonic and witches and warlocks and Wicca. Now, that's even coming prevalent in schools now, even from the teachers, by the way. Uh, that's the occult. Occult is anything that adds the Bible and takes away the, essentially the deity of Jesus. And we see a lot of cults out there. Um, they add something to the Bible or change the Bible. Jehovah Witnesses take the Bible and they change it to fit their doctrine. That's a cult. Mormons add to the Bible the Book of Mormon. That is a cult. Christian science adds the writings of uh, Mary Baker Eddy. Um, it, if you don't believe in the claims of Jesus, you are not saved, period. Uh, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. Only one way. And it ain't Mary either. What? Okay. So, yeah. There, if you're out there believing this and giving this in love and truth, um, there's going to be resistance to your mission in the form of persecution and coming violence, in the form of false teaching. So you better know what you need to know. The last one is this, and uh, Ron read this in 14, 8 through 19. I don't call this so much false doctrine, but world's wisdom. 
And you're going to see the church here belonging to the world's wisdom. They, they change truth depending on emotions and how they feel. I call that what world's wisdom. Well, false doctrine is everywhere, and we're warned to be careful in the church. Um, we see slight variations from the truth, and you're going to hear this in some preaching in some uh, churches. Uh, they only like to listen to cheery, light, uh, kind of relational therapy, psychological how-tos. Um, it's hard to catch sometimes because they throw in a Bible verse. But the world's wisdom, I would say, even more so than false doctrine, world's wisdom is actually probably more prevalent. Because people, professing believers, even believers, if, if it was possible, Jesus said, uh, they don't stand on the rock of his word. And Christians can even be pushovers and weak or light faith or lack of faith because they relied so much on experience or emotion. I call that world's wisdom. They look a lot like the people of Lystra that Ron read. Uh, their beliefs change depending on what? S circumstances and experiences. Paul and Barnabas are uh, gods, right? Um, look what's happening. Someone got healed. They're gods, he says in 1414. Um, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they're gods, uh, they tore their clothes and rushed to the crowd saying, men, why are you doing this? So they're calling them gods and then all of a sudden something's flipped. And they're stoning him to death. Why? Because they're, they're basing everything standing on experience and emotion and not God's word. Okay, that's world's wisdom. Think about that. If the, I, I, I say welcome to my misery when I'm preaching. I said, do I ever do this? Think about it. A hospital visit. Our doctor says something. Our one crass word from somebody. And you're not relying on God's word. You're not reacting like Jesus, but it just triggers something. Not faith, but at times doubt or worry or anger, general lack of trust. That, I say, Holy Spirit, help me see. That's me relying on world's wisdom. Dave's trying to live a worldly wisdom way instead of standing on the rock. Know this, your ministry will face resistance and it's going to come in all different shapes and sizes. Persecution, be ready for it. Uh, false doctrine, be alert for it. Uh, world's wisdom, be listening for it. And the only way is to be in the word and hearing the, hearing the word of God where faith comes from. So know this, you're a missionary. It's measured by faithfulness. That's a huge whew. He's not doing any other successful barometers, but it's measured by faithfulness. It's also going to meet with some resistance. Some of you are going to say, hmm. Lastly, know this about your mission work. It's going to involve being marred with battle scars. You will get wounded. Please know that. You will get wounded. Uh, they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. Paul goes back into the city, and he tries to encourage the disciples. If you were stoned and left for dead, what would you be doing? Continuing? I would be writing my resignation letter. Right? I would quit. I would give up. Pack it in, shake the dust, throw in the towel. Paul keeps going. What is this about him? Keeps going. And he, hear, hear this verse. He, he just got stoned. He gathers everyone around him and he says, we must go through, you know, is he, is he breathing like this because he just got pummeled? We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, he says in verse 22. That, that when he said those words, was he wincing? When, when he said those words, did he have bandages on his head? Was the blood still dripping down his face? Could people see the scars, of the, the open scabs? What, what did they see when he's pulled from the mess like this, walks back into the city, and that's the message he's going to say? We must go through many hardships. Yeah, you're going to have wounds. You're going to have battle scars. The wounds were still visible when he said it. This Christian life, this path of God, the will of God that he has for you, this process of Christ's likeness that you're on, this life that Jesus rules, this life of being a missionary, it's one-on-one -on -one with God's heart, uh, one who hurts for the lost, even the lost who are throwing rocks at you. Know this, um, sheep bite. Work with sheep, they're not the brightest animals, and they bite. People will hurt. You will even experience some friendly fire from fellow Christians. Yeah, this Christian life, you will wear the scars. You will have the battle wounds. Your soul will ache over lost people throwing their life away, 
relationships even severed because of priorities. Here's what Kent Hughes says his, in his uh, commentary on Acts. There is a cost to sincere service for Christ. Never share your faith and you will never look like a fool. Never stand for righteousness on a social issue and you will never be rejected. Never walk out of a theater because of a movie or play is offensive and you will never be called a prig. Never practice consistent honesty in business and you will not lose the trade of a not so honest associate. Never reach out to the needy and you will never be taken advantage of. Never give your heart and it will never be broken. Never go to Cyprus and you will never be subjected to a dizzy, heart convulsing confrontation with Satan. Seriously follow Christ and you will experience a gamut of sorrows almost completely unknown to the unbeliever. But of course, you will also know the joy of adventure with the Lord of the universe and of spiritual victory as you live the life of allegiance to him. Yeah, know this missionary. You're going to have some resistance. Yeah, you're going to meet some people that will reject you. Paul kept going. It's incredible. As I stepped back and looked at these missionary pointers, I said, why did Paul keep going? Not only finish the first missionary journey, but why go on journey number two or three? Who would call it in? If you made it back successfully, you made it back unscathed, right? Still breathing. Um, would you go on missionary number two, journey number two and three? Huh? Paul does. So I said, why? Why would he keep going? Here's why. Endurance. That's it. Yeah. Endurance. Uh, he persevered. Battle scar after battle scar, he kept going. Uh, you're a missionary for life. You're on a mission from God. You're an ambassador. Know this. Uh, it's a race. It's a marathon, and you're going to need endurance. Paul didn't give up. If you look at these chapters from 13.4 through uh, chapter 14, uh, go through yourself and, and look for all these keep going verses. Uh, there's so many of them, 13, 51, and 52, uh, 14, 6, and 7. Keyword, he continued to preach the good news. That's an endurance word. Uh, 14, 20, after getting stoned, he got up. He went back. It says he went back into the city. You know what he's saying? He went back into the fight. I mean, he, he's on the ground with this coach, uh, right? The ref is counting the, the, it's the standing eight. What is that? Eight, ten? He's on the ground. His coach is telling him to stay down. Right, Rocky, stay down. He gets up. Why? Endurance. 1421, after getting up, they preach the good news in that city. Endurance. After going. Here's some of the language you face. After going, they came into, they went down, they sailed back. What is that? Why keep going? Why not quit? Why not give up? And how can I stick to the mission like he did? Says, stick to the purpose that God has given me. Remember 13, uh, David, uh, David, for when David served God's perfect purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. How can I fulfill God's purpose with, with such painful experiences like Paul? Not a lot of results initially for Paul. The only answer is this, and endurance. That's it. Not giving up, not quitting. So real quick, we're going to close with this. Three things that we need in order to endure. Okay, and these are coming from Acts 14. Um, how can you and me and we endure in this race? Well, if it is a race, if it is a marathon, the first thing you need to do is run. Hello? You're writing this down? In order to race, you got to run. Uh, if you're watching from the sidelines, there's something wrong. If you're living in fear, which we talked about last week, last week I got more positive and negative um, uh, comments about last week's sermon than I ever have, I, I believe, ever. Um, and the, the whole point of it, here's what I said, the whole point of it is if you're one of these people living in fear, there's something wrong. There's a disconnect. Disconnect. Um, by the way, a lot more positive than negative, so whew, thank you. Okay. Um, but it, it, if you're living in fear and, and it's paralyzing you to put into play the resources of your life, there is a disconnect because Jesus does not want his followers to live in fear. So in order to run a marathon, you must first run now, some of us are going to stumble right here because uh, I only like to run when I'm being chased. Any of you? Hmm. But you got to run. Paul and Barnabas were able to endure because they jumped into the race. They weren't idle. They weren't bystanders. They weren't discouraged from the rocks being thrown at them, discouraged enough to give up. Uh, were they misunderstood? They were called gods. And they were mistreated. They were stoned. But they 
got endurance by being in the game, and then endurance came from there by running in the race. The, James said, what, what is the after effect of enduring? What do you get if you persevere and not give up? It's the other side of perseverance. There is blessing. Some Christians wonder why they never experience blessing or have the blessed life. They're not enduring because it's on the other side of perseverance. First thing you need to do is run. Second thing quickly is rhythm. I call this rhythm. I had a friend that called me when we lived in Indiana. He said, uh, I want to train for a marathon. It's on my bucket list. Would you help me train for a marathon? I said, I'll pray about it. Uh, three years later, I got back to, no. Um, uh, I said, sure, I, I would help him uh, train the marathon. Uh, what, what, he was reading a book, things he had to eat and things he had to do. The initial uh, training for four to five miles, you need someone with you to have that rhythm. Uh, so I said I would go with him uh, to get started. He needed a pacer. He needed someone to run with, and he chose me. <laughs> Um, uh, why this is important is, you know, I'm so athletic. I think he wanted someone that's really fast and he could try and catch up to. No, that wasn't it. Um, I don't like running. Uh, so I, I did the first um, initial training. I don't know how many weeks it took till we got to um, four or five miles with a nice pace. I was his pacer. Sometimes he would not be there in the morning, in the winter, dead of winter, Chicago. Um, I would just go without him then because I was supposed to be the pacer. Uh, he had said one morning when I left without him, he saw where I was running uh, because he saw my, my footsteps in the snow. Um, other times, um, you know, he would come up to my door and I'd be hiding in my living room. Uh, um, but I, I did it for him until about four and a half, five miles, and then I said, you're on your own. I hope you learned pacing and rhythm because I'm done. Um, he, have, he eventually ran the marathon and did it, scratched it off his bucket list. Um, but know this, in this marathon, uh, do you want to know who our pacer is? The Holy Spirit. And, and if he's always with you, if you're in the race, you're never alone in the marathon. You have a pacer, the Holy Spirit. If you do nursery, if you do youth, if you do music, if you do teaching, if you do home groups, if you do any kind of elder or deacon-like ministry, and if you're doing it in your own muscles, you're not pacing with the Holy Spirit. Just know that. You're going to grow tired you're going to grow burdened, and you're going to grow bitter, and you're going to grow weary. Why? Because you're serving amongst sheep, and sheep sometimes bite. So you need that pacing of the Holy Spirit. If you're trying to work with people, and they're human people, they will bite, they will resist, they will be thankless at times. Ron talked about gratitude today. Sometimes they may even use stones. Ouch. But the Holy Spirit, they kept going. Look at uh, chapter 14, verse 9. Uh, there's a guy who is lame from birth. Uh, he had never walked. Verse 90, listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him. Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. What is that? Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. He called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. You know what that saw that he had faith to be healed? You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit working in tandem with flawed Paul's humanness and giftedness. And availability, availability is he's in the race running. That's what that is. That's the pacing, the rhythm of the Holy Spirit. The side note here, um, the environment where the Spirit flourishes is humility. Please know that. Uh, we have a huge issue today in America. I don't even know if it's a world thing, but a global thing. But in American Christianity, uh, evangelicalism especially, we have a problem with celebrity Christian Christianity, celebrity Christians. We love our celebrity Christians. And what we're doing is we're doing evangelicalism through the lenses of Americana or the American dream, and we deem success. Uh, here's what we think in our Americanism. We see success and we say, uh, God's got to be with them. Why? Because they're American successful. Um, and then we see so many of them fall now. And then people are falling because the celebrities are falling. Uh, they said about uh, Carol Lentz was one of the latest ones, uh, some Hillsong guy in New York. Um, as someone told him, they said, if they idolize you, they will also demonize you. And uh, they're certainly piling on and demonizing him now. What is that? It's, that's evangelical celebrity Christianity. Look, look at Paul and Barnabas' reaction to the popularity they, they had. They're so popular. Here's what they do. They, they, they tear their clothes and they cry out truth. Not give me more money. Not look at how popular we are and take advantage of the popularity. No, no, if you're a missionary, if criticism is going to kill you, 
Like someone says they look at you bad, someone takes the last donut, something. Um, if criticism kills you, compliments are going to puff you up. You, know, you need that, what, environment where the Holy Spirit flourishes. He's the rhythm. He serves in an environment of humility. Like cr criticism and compliments bounce off of you. Take anything you need, especially in the form of compliments, as a, as a means of spiritual encouragement. Disregard the rest. Max Lucado, I've been listening to his sermons again. He got out of pulpit ministry for a while. He jumped back into it. So I've heard a few of his uh, sermons over the last uh, uh, many months, I guess. But he starts his sermons out. I don't know if this is a new thing. But Max Lucado starts his sermons off by saying this. Father, forgive the speaker for his sins are too numerous to mention. I said, boy, I like that. I like that. The, the point is that the Holy Spirit is the pacer and gets the glory. Uh, if you are looking to accomplish anything positive and eternal, uh, it's because the Spirit has grafted you into the life-giving vine in which you can bear fruit. So learn to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Now, know this, either the Bible is true or it is not, right? The deity of Christ, we all would say amen to. We all know that Jesus is, this God's, uh, is, is God, is deity. It's spelled out, we say amen. But uh, I think Christians sometimes have an issue with God being shepherd, and Father, and King, and Lord, and Guide, and Pathmaker. Either he's going to guide you in your path, or he's not. Either he's going to pace you, and direct you, and shepherd, and guide you, or he's not. So decisions, run it by him as your God, and Lord, and Shepherd, and King, and Guide, and Pathmaker. He is our guide. Um, opposition doesn't mean retreat. That's verse 3 of chapter 14. Stoning doesn't mean defeat. That's verse 20. And moving on didn't mean failure, right? But look what Paul does in the, at the end of the chapter. He gets back to the, uh, his home church, Antioch, verse 27. On arriving there, they gathered the church together. And here's what Paul and Barnabas did. They reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Well, I would lead with, I got stoned and left for dead. Wouldn't you lead with that? He's leading. Why? Because it's all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about what God did through them. It's incredible. So to run this race, to get endurance, you've got to first put into practice, put into play the resources of your life. You need to run. You need to be in the pacing of the Holy Spirit. Last thing, um, and they stayed, verse 28, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. I call this recovery. Recovery. Uh, recovery has this key word in verse 20, verse 21, and verse 28. Um, the place of recovery, like how can I recover? It's, it's, you're going to need certain people and you're going to need a specific place. That's how you recover. For Paul, it was Antioch, his home church, his sending church. And what he needed there was not just anybody. He needed disciples. Huge difference. Doesn't say the believers, doesn't say the Christians, the disciples. Uh, Christians are great. Christians are wonderful. But disciples, that's a whole other level of support and rest and refreshment, recovery. Disciples are learners. Uh, they help us recuperate. They're, they're the ones that aren't ashamed to bring prayers of healing, words of encouragement. It's there you find rest. Rest is part of the recovery. Paul was always about, on these missionary journeys, always about building strong friendships. So I would ask, uh, are you a strong friend to people? What makes a strong friend? Disciples get rest. They give rest. And they get and give prayers. They're good friends. There's that meshness. If you're not part of a home group, there's a few of them that have been meeting in this pandemic. Um, if you're interested, I don't think it's too late just to come, learn, fellowship, and uh, that's where that recovery comes from. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for, uh, Lord, endurance that is you give for the asking, and Lord, you give it through perseverance. You give, it, you give blessing through the endurance. Lord, help us to not be the kind of people that give up. Help us to understand the mission you've given us. Help us to desire to fulfill it in the power of your spirit. So Lord, as we leave, help us to remember how wonderful you are. Also help us to remember that we're on a mission. So Holy Spirit, lead and guide us. Give us words to say in Jesus' name.